and management of Salem Media of Hawaii. Aloha, and this is Be Fit for Health. This is Bianca, your host. I'm very happy to be here today, as usual. It's another great day for us to celebrate our health and wellness. And, you know, I know I say this every week, and, and I mean it. Um, I'm not just saying it because I have a new guest in, in the studio with me, but it's because that every time I have an incredibly brilliant, smart, you know, you know, it just teaches us new things every single week. These people are just incredible. And I'm so excited to, to have today's show because... It is for me to have this doctor, a medical doctor, in my studio. I know he is one of the most busiest doctors I know, and he's so well sought after because he's brilliant. And I mean, brilliant is an understatement. And he took the time to actually come into the studio today to be with me physically. And I can't even say how honored and in awe I am that you're here instead of just calling it in because, you know, with the pandemic and everything, some people are, are gun shy to come into the studio. But I do appreciate you coming into the studio. And, and you guys are probably going, who the hell is she talking about? So let me introduce him. I have Dr. David Singh. He is the Chief Department of Cardiovascular Disease and the Queens Medical Center. He is the he is a cardiac electrophysiologist say that a couple of times um, he is the associate professor of medicine of John A. Burns School of Medicine did I say that a couple of times yes he's also someone who is specialized in cardiac electrophysiology he's a clinical interest center on uh, catheter ablations of superventricle and like, why, why do people give me such hard words to say on the radio <laughs> Superventricle and complex arrhythmias, including arterial fibrillation and ventricle tachycardia. Dr. Singh earned his medical degree at Georgetown University School of Medicine and completed his internal medicine residency training at the University of California in San Francisco. He continued his training at cardiovascular disease at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, where he served as Chief Cardio Cardiology Fellow in 2009. He returned to US UCSF to undertake training in electrophysiology. Dr. Singh has been involved in a number of clinical research, including in development of novel techniques for better recognition of cardiac arrhythmias, risk factors for sudden cardiac death, and ablation techniques for arterial fibrillation. Dr. Singh also has helped to sp uh, spearhead a number of international health uh, um, in initiatives and maintains a passion for working with underserved populations he is currently part of the electrophysiology team that conducts teaching and electrophysiology procedures in Cambodia. In 2009, he founded the Northern uh, Marana, uh, was it Marana Islands, I can't say it, he'll correct me, to cardiology care to this region. As a cardi cardiology fellow, he co-founded the Los Angeles Free Cardiology <coughs> Clinic and devoted it to providing cardiology care to the individuals lacking in adequate access to health care. God bless him. He has served a chief of Department of Cardiovascular Disease for the Queens Medical Center since 2019. Welcome, doctor, to the Be Fit for Health show. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to read all of them. No, I have to. Listen, if you're going to put in the time, people need to all know. Right. Well, I, I mean, that's you. amazing because you are, I mean, like we were just talking about this. There is cardiology. And then there's cardiology, physiology. I mean, I think the, the most important part of the heart is knowing how it functions and how to fix the problem because the structure and the anatomy and the mechanics of it is so different in, in different realms of cardiology. I think what you're doing is very specific and it's so important and most people don't know what exactly you do. So what exactly is a cardiac um, physiologist? So electrophysiologist, yeah. Um, and yeah, a lot of people don't know what we do and have an even harder time pronouncing it. So like me? I think they do it pretty well. <laughs> but um, an electrophysiologist is a physician that has gone through training as an internal medicine doctor, so just like a primary care doctor, has done a fellowship in general cardiology, and then done an advanced fellowship in electrophysiology, which focuses pretty exclusively on electrical disorders of the heart. And we'll get into this, I'm sure, right. in our discussion, but basically, Everything in the heart that happens, happens because of electricity. And when things go wrong, electrically speaking, electrophysiologists tend to get involved. So you basically deal with what types of disorders when it comes to the heart. So, um, you know, cardio, myopathy, what else? Yeah, well, basically there are two basic problems that can go wrong 
electrically speaking. Okay. One, the heart can go too slow, or two, the heart can go too fast. Okay. And it depends how severe it is, but some arrhythmias, that's, what, that's the, the technical name for when the heart rhythm that we're supposed to be in goes amok, it goes awry. So if you're having a bradyarrhythmia, that's a heart rhythm that's too slow. And oftentimes we'll use pacemakers and other devices to deal with that. Hmm. If the heart's going too fast, there's a whole litany of different heart rhythms that are fast. Some of them can lead to death, right? So we have to treat them very seriously. Some of them are just a nuisance for patients and they end up having to go to the emergency room a lot. So we deal, we deal with both, too slow and too fast. And like you pointed out, cardiomyopathy is when the muscle of the heart, there's something wrong with that, and the heart is weak. And because everything's connected, not right. only in the heart, but in the whole body. If you have a weak heart, that means that electrically you might be at more risk for certain electrical disorders. Or vice versa. If you have an electrical problem, that can lead to cardiomyopathy. Muscular, yeah. yeah. Is that, it's, and it's true for, and, you, and you're talking to someone who has fibromyalgia, or at least I was diagnosed with it. So, and I know a lot of fibromyalgia patients have a certain heart issue because it's electrical, right? It's neurological. It's so, it, is, it does affect the heart as well. So that's an umbrella for a lot of symptoms. So, you know, when you have someone who has electrical issues that's widespread and you're trying to deal with balancing the heart, I mean, you may have to also figure out how to balance out other parts of the body, too, to, so you can get the heart engaged and going. So my suspicion is, and I'm going to jump into this before we get into the nitty-gritty of how the heart function works and everything else, is I was telling you this earlier, was that I believe the vagal system started, the jump started the entire fibromyalgia program in my body. So, which is, you know, the disorder, I think I was probably misdiagnosed. I think there must be a, a vagus nerve disorder of some sort. There has to be some kind of a, an issue there because I have the slew of symptoms because it goes from the brain to the heart, to the lungs, to the digestive system, and it goes all the way down. And it's the longest running nerve. And I know that if it's hitting the heart and if I can somehow control the vagal response, maybe I can also control the, the PVCs that I have in my heart. I mean, what do you think about that? Um, well, I think you're right on that the body is all connected. Right. And, you know, for better or worse in Western medicine, the way the paradigm is set up, we're really good at some things and not so good at others. Uh -huh. We're really good at reducing things down to smaller and smaller pieces. So I'm like a sub-subspecialist. I know a lot about a very small aspect of the right. heart. But the reality is, is you know, I know in, in Western medicine, we also know that everything is connected. So even though you may be looking with a microscope at a very small area, to see the big picture, in Western medicine, we're not as good as that. Good yeah. at that. And so a lot of my challenge is, you know, how do I help patients, but also try to see the big picture. And I think there's an increasing awareness about, you know, different forms of medicine, different traditions of healing and how they may interact and, and work together to, to help a patient. Yeah, you're kind of part of the uh, sublet of energy medicine. I kind of feel like with energy medicine, the way that they're looking at frequencies, you know, in the body, they're working in the brain, they're working in the body system. It's almost like Chinese medicine when they work with the meridians and how things are connected to each other via nervous system. Um, I think yours is much more westernized, obviously, much more specific, but it's energy medicine it seems to be the front lines for a lot of uh, treatments. It's kind of like old school electrical shock system that they used to do to get certain things jump started in the right rhythm way. Um, modern now technology, thank God, is not so intrusive and not so invasive. Um, but um, so let's get to the to the nitty gritty of what you do. So after uh, you diagnose, let's say somebody, what? How would you? Let's well, we can start with me if you like, because yeah, you know you, you're my electro. Heart, a cardiologist, yes. <laughs> electrophysical cardiologist, about an hour too long, man. Um, and you you took me in about a year ago. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a little puppy you took in, right? <laughs> no, Poor. I took you in as a human. Okay, thank you. Although right. I did get my first puppy this, during the COVID pandemic. Oh, which what, what type of dog did you I get? I got a Pomeranian. Oh. Yeah, I used to travel a lot for work, and that all came to a screeching halt. And, right, right. And I was just sitting at home, and I was You're like, I want a dog. Yeah. And so I got this really cute Pomeranian, and I actually named my Pomeranian after my electrophysiology mentor. His name is Natish Badwar, he's at wow. Stanford. And so my Pomeranian's name is Tish. Tish, oh. And he's our official EP mascot. Nice. Yes. How come I never got to meet the dog? They won't no. let me bring him in oh. just yet. But come we'll on, man, on that. come on. Yeah. That's terrible. 
Okay, well, you know what? That's the best thing ever because my, my, just, okay, just on a side note, I really do feel like pets also help with calming your system down or the panic attacks that you might get from the, mis the, the fear factor of what's happening in your body. It brings a certain level of, I don't know, whatever it may be. It's just for me, I think pets, all pets should be considered, what are the, what do they call those pets that, that you need the to? The service animals. Yeah, I think all of them are service animals, whether they're trained or not. Yeah. And it does get cumbersome. There was a lady uh, a couple of years ago who had uh, an emotional support pony, and oh. she brought the pony on the plane. Really? Yeah. You can, like, look it up. It's pretty weird. Was, she, was the pony registered? Yeah. Wow. But, I mean, it, it's still a pony. Yeah, but how's a pony get trained? I mean, they're smart, though. I mean, dog, horses are smart. They are. I so, mean, horses are amazing animals. Yeah. I just don't know that I would want to sit next to one on a plane. I don't know. I probably would play with it the whole ride over. <laughs> So cute. There was an apple. Okay, okay, we're getting sidetracked. Derailed. That's, I know, right? Totally. <laughs> so, the structure of the heart and the way that you look at it from your type of uh, specialty, um, we have what what we measure is high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic. Mm -hmm. As as a electro, cardio electrophysiologist, what part of that high blood pressure or normal blood pressure do you look at to verify whether or not there is something electrical going on with the heart? Well, blood pressure is a complex phenomenon. And, and you know, I mean, everything in the body relates in one way or another to electricity. Uh, traditionally, EPs don't focus so much on blood pressure. I mean, obviously it's important. If I have a patient with a heart rhythm disorder, let's say atrial fibrillation, which we can talk about later, but that's the most common heart rhythm disorder in, in adults. And if I'm trying to treat their atrial fibrillation and I don't address the fact that their blood pressure is through the roof, then I'm not going to be able to make much headway, mm -hmm. right? So in general, with blood pressure, the guy, it's a kind of a moving target. You know, when I was in med school, the systolic blood pressure, which is the top number, you know, it was quite permissive. And that bar keeps continuing to move as we get more and more research. But in general, I, you know, if you look at the data, and there's a ton of data about high blood pressure in, in our field in Western right. medicine, um, it really seems to be more systolic blood pressure than mm -hmm. matters. I mean, diastolic blood pressure does matter, but in terms of the consequences of high blood pressure, it tends to be systolic. And it tends to be what your body is seeing over time, right? right? So we know that if you have super high systolic blood pressure, it can lead to all sorts of things down, down the line in terms of complications. You can have strokes, you can develop heart disease, you can develop you know, a cardiomyopathy like you mentioned, you can develop eye problems. I mean, it basically can ravage the body if it's not treated. So in cardiology in general, uh, and in just in the medicine with a capital M, we tend to try and control the systolic blood pressure and get that number. Uh, usually below 130 milliliters right. of mercury if we can. And, and if somebody has a, an average blood pressure and they have cardiomyopathy, then what would be what would be the the problem there? I mean, how would you how would you take care of that person? Because if everything else is normal but they still have cardiomyopathy, how do you? Fix yeah, that? well, it's a bit of a chicken and egg question. So one one issue is did the high blood pressure lead to the cardiomyopathy? You know, and if it didn't. Well, if it did, then obviously you want to right. treat it, and there's a chance it might get better. Mm -hmm. But even if the high blood pressure didn't cause the cardiomyopathy, if you have untreated high blood pressure, it's going to make things even worse. Right. So regardless of whether there's cause and effect in that particular scenario, you definitely want to treat the blood pressure. Can you get cardiomyopathy without high blood pressure? Oh, totally. Okay. There's, there's, so you can ways. get it from viruses, you can get it from COVID, you can get it from... Really? Uh, yeah. You can get it from drinking too much alcohol. Mm. You can get it from uh, just, they're you just, really... You just upset a lot of people who are like, well, alcohol. yeah, I mean, truth <laughs> be told, the alcohol thing is fascinating because, you know, the, there's data to support like a little bit of alcohol may actually be good right. for cardiovascular yeah. health, but um, we do know that there are certain conditions where alcohol can be really quite toxic. Is it because of the, the way that it turns into sugar, or is it because of, I mean, because there's different ways of sugar, right? But is the sugar factor the reason, or? Uh, you know, I'll be honest and tell you, I don't know specifically why alcohol can, is toxic to the heart. I don't know if it's the sugar content or something else in alcohol, but 
if you have a weak heart, for example, we really counsel people not to drink alcohol at all because it can worsen things. Well, if you're a weak heart and you're taking medication, first of all, you shouldn't be drinking any alcohol because that's going to mess you up even further. Yeah. Uh, but most people don't listen to that because... They, they like alcohol. Yeah, they like their alcohol. So what are you going to do? Um, and that's a challenge as a doctor, I'm sure. So with the, that being said, okay, let's say it's not your blood pressure and everything seems to be fine there, but there is still a question of what's causing the heart to have an arrhythmia. Um, so give us a little quick rundown on the conduction factor of the heart. How does that work? What happens to the heart to get a rhythm? Yeah, that's great. So that, that's our bread and butter. So everything in the heart that occurs mechanically occurs because there's an electrical event that precedes it. Okay. So we call that electrical mechanical coupling. So in the heart, there's something that we refer to as the conduction system. And that just means that in everybody's heart, there are specialized cells that are really, really good at conducting electricity. And it starts up in the right atrium, just to, to break it down, the heart has four chambers. Right. A right atrium, a right uh, ventricle, a left atrium, a left ventricle. Up and down. Yeah. Up and down. And at the top of the right atrium, there's this thing called the sinus node, and that's like the master pacemaker of your heart. So it's telling the heart how fast to beat. It's a really a, a remarkable thing just from an evolutionary standpoint. When you're sleeping, you don't need your heart to be doing much, so it's gonna slow down the heart, right? When, you, when we sleep, our heart slows down because the body knows. And the body is so elegantly designed. Mm -hmm. Really, it's, it is really quite, quite a miracle. Right. The body slows it down, you don't need you know, to, to have a heart rate of 110 when you're sleeping, unless you're having a bad That'd be rate. really hard to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Or maybe you do, maybe you're having a nightmare and, and you know, you're experiencing right. some terror and you do. But anyway, but when if you're trying to run a marathon or if you're climbing stairs like I tried to do today because the elevators weren't working, my heart rate kicked up, right? Because I need, my body needs more oxygen. Right. And the heart's a pump. Right. At the end of the day, it's only purpose in our bodies in, in life to is to pump, pump yep. oxygenated blood to every cell in our body. And so if you need more oxygen, the heart has to pump more. So that sinus node fires. Now, that results in the two top chambers squeezing blood into the lower chambers, which are called the ventricles. That electrical signal travels down to the middle of the heart to another node called the AV node. There's no way for that signal from the top of the heart to get to the bottom of the heart without going through the AV node. So it relays down through the AV node. It hits this... Um, network of cells called the Hisperkinji system. And as a result of that electrical impulse, the ventricles squeeze. contract. Yeah. yeah. And that's how you get the blood out of the body too, right? That's how you get blood to, I mean, the, to, to the rest of the body. That's yeah. correct. To the okay. body and to the lungs. Because the right side of the heart is sending deoxygenated blood mm -hmm. to the lungs. So when we breathe, oxygen goes into our lungs, the blood passes through the lungs, picks up oxygen, and brings it back. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, so it's really interesting because there's also on top of that, just to give it give people an idea how that works, there's like two vena cava, right? Those at the top part there, mm -hmm. aren't they the, where one part of the vena, vena cava takes the deoxygenated blood into the heart to get it oxygenated. It's almost like a filter system. It goes like a filtration system, right? I try to, listen, with every guest I have, I got to learn a little bit so yeah. I sound smart. <laughs> No, you're getting it. And then it goes through the heart system, gets oxygenated uh, through some, through am lungs. I right? And then it gets, goes to the system like you were just talking about, and then gets sent yeah. out to the body. Yeah. So how does it, so how does it come back to the, to the heart again? So after it's been sent out to the body, how does it come back into the heart? So the pump from the heart is pushing blood in this circuit, right? Mm -hmm. So it goes all the way out to your toes and to like these little tiny, tiny blood vessels called capillaries all the oxygen is extracted, and then it enters what we refer to as the venous system. The mm. venous system brings deoxygenated blood back to the heart, Got it. and the pump is just pumping, pumping, so it, the blood is just continuously moving. It comes back to the heart through either the superior vena cava, which t is coming from the top, like from your brain, or the inferior vena cava, inferior vena cava which is coming from the because you know, nice. we still have to oxygenate the brain too, right? So yeah, some people is... more than others. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah, so it, it comes back to the it comes back to the heart on the right side, and then the right side of the heart, the right ventricle pumps that blood to the lungs to pick it up. So when you yeah. have an arrhythmia where there's a default in either the SA node or the AV node, right? Um, 
then you're basically messing the pumping system to the body, which will then eventually may cause your muscular system to not function the way it should. Now, there is, there is a scenario which I had uh, encountered last year, which is called ejection fraction, yes. which, is the, um, which is the process in which my, my body gets the blood, the rest of my body gets the blood, how much, uh, I guess, the heart pumps out the blood to the rest of the body, right? Yeah, that's right. So, now, is, is, how do you correct, do you, go to this, do you go to the nodes, or do you go to the cells that are, that are part of the ventricle system at the final aspect of the conduction system? Yeah, so let's, let's uh, there are a couple things in there. So you mentioned ejection fraction. What we, we in cardiology pay a lot of attention to ejection fraction because it refers to basically how well the pump is pumping. Every time the heart squeezes, a certain percentage of blood is going to be ejected from the left ventricle. That's what's pumping blood to your brain and to your kidneys and your toes and every other part of your body. Now, in a normal person, about 55 to 60 percent of the blood in the left ventricle is ejected every time the heart pumps. So an ejection fraction of 60 to 65 percent is normal. And if the heart's super weak, maybe only 20 percent of that blood is getting out. And so you can imagine if only 20% of the blood is getting out to your body, people feel really bad because their cells aren't being oxygenated. Yeah. Now, in terms of how to treat it, if if the rhythm, well, we, do you want to talk about your? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can talk about my PVCs because yeah. they know. Yeah. My okay. audience knows that preventricle contraction. Yeah. So you have something called premature, or premature. ventricular contractions or complexes. And what that means is normally in the heart, the activation of the heart is from top to bottom, right. right? And that's a very efficient way of having the heart pump. PVCs are when there's a rogue area in one of your ventricles, either right or left side, that just decides to have a mind of its own and starts <laughs> causing the pump to beat on its own from the bottom up Ooh. instead of from the atria to the ventricles, from the ventricles sometimes back to the atria. Now, what happens with PVCs is the efficiency of the heart is really compromised. So if you have uh, the pump being activated from top to bottom, it's a very, usually very robust. You get a lot of blood out because mm. it's an efficient contraction. That's the way it was designed. If you have a PVC, a lot less blood comes out mm. uh, oftentimes. And so some people can really feel that because if every other beat, in yeah. your case, sometimes every other it beat was. was a PVC. It was, yeah. That means effectively your cardiac output, which is a, a global measure of how much blood is being pumped, is effectively cut in half. Right. So people can feel really, really bad. So oh, yeah. for some people that have PVCs like you do, if they're feeling bad, we want to treat those PVCs. Yeah. We want to suppress them. We can suppress them with medications. We can suppress them with a procedure called an ablation, which is what I do where I go look for the PVCs, try to get rid of it. The whole point is to, to make people like yourself who are experiencing symptoms feel better. Yeah, it's the most uncomfortable feeling. I don't think people have ever, uh, the only way I can describe it is like, it's like your heart stops for a split second and then it goes. And sometimes the, when it starts back up again, my whole body goes with it. It's like I can, it's that powerful. And try to sleep with that, you can't lay down. I mean, you're just like, you're like, okay, this is so uncomfortable. So when I first, this is way in the beginning when I first got it, but then now, you know, through medication, I've been able to suppress it to a certain degree. And after seeing you actually, Dr. Singh, I, I gotta give you a little credit here. You changed my medication and um, I'm a bit like my ventricle. I'm a little stubborn. I kind of do make my own little plan. You gave me the lowest dose of flaconide, and I and you said to take half of that, but I ended up taking half of a half. So so I took I'm taking the most minuscule amount of medication, and um, we're gonna do a, a check later. But I've relatively have lessened my PVCs by considerable amount in one year. Uh, maybe because you scared me with the surgery, <laughs> with the ablation. I'm like, no, sometimes. no ablation, no ablation. We're going to fix this. Mind over matter. But that's, that's why I kind of went back to the vagal system, and that's why I thought about brain power, uh, controlling the way that my, my brain reacts to things, to stress, a fight-or-flight program, uh, trying to stop the, um, the sympathetic system so that my autonomic system takes. Because that's where the healing factors begin in the body, because you're talking about how miraculous the body is. It is. It is the most self-reliant uh, system I've ever seen anywhere. It really self-regulates itself, and it can if given the right components. And I think you gave me the right component with that me particular medication, 
because I think with my own experience and things that I've done and with the medication, I've been really able to lessen that to the point where I forget that I have a heart because that's what you should be feeling is you should, you should feel nothing. You should not know that you have a heart. It should just be automatic, right? Right. But when you feel that you have a heart or an organ, that's when you know you've got problems. Something isn't working. Yeah, that's totally right. And, um, you know, I, you said something very interesting, which is, you know, I, you know, have some experience and knowledge about what medications might work. But I really believe that people know their bodies the best. So you kind of took what I suggested and you adapted it because you kind of know what works for you. Yeah, I, th I don't, I'm not well with medication. I can't do well yeah, with medication. Yeah, and a lot so. of people aren't. And so, as a basic principle in, in medicine, we want to use the lowest dose of medication that we need to get the desired result. Right. Because you can always increase it. You can always increase it. But you can't really decrease it, because then it doesn't really... Well, doesn't you start work. to lose efficacy yeah. if you yeah. do, so you have to find that sweet spot. Yeah. It just seems like you did, because your symptoms seem much, much better. Yeah. Right. Thank God. I mean, yes. It's but wonderful. you still need an ablation. Yeah, I know, man. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll check on that after the... Uh, the Holter. So let's talk about a little bit about the, the technology factor because I remember back in the day when you talk about pacemakers being put into a heart because to regulate the heart rate, it was this big hunk of thing that you put in, you could see it under the skin. Now it's like almost like the size of like a bullet. Mm -hmm. And um, what's now? What do we have now? Is there anything that's been updated or anything that's new that's in technology? Yeah, well, like just like a lot of things in technology, things are getting smaller, you know, more sophisticated. Battery life is getting longer. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, some of the earlier pace, earliest pacemakers, they were just, uh, they were life-saving, but they were just massive. Yeah. And, you know, now, as you pointed out, we have some pacemakers that are the size of the tip of my pinky finger. Yeah. Um, so you have to choose the right one for the right patient, but in general, one of the reasons I love electrophysiology is because it, it is very technology oriented and it's like the technology, even I've been practicing for about 10 years and if I think about even what I was doing and the technology I was using when I first started practicing to now, it's, a, it's completely different yeah. in many ways. So it is really exciting to be in a field that's rapidly evolving because it means we're able to help patients with these electrical disorders more and more. So it's exciting to be kind of like on the Yeah, wave. I mean, see, I'm, I guess I'm a, I get bored quickly. Yeah, So I, I, I kind of, I kind of like, and I don't think I have ADD, but I, I do have a curiosity to things. And um, so for You're me- You're not bored with this interview, though, are you? No, not yet. Okay. I'll Just let, let you know, know though. Don't worry, we'll go to a commercial break if that's the case. <laughs> I don't think we'll be having a commercial break today, though, guys. I've, there's so many questions that I have, especially wanting to learn more about how to control this this PPC thing. Now, PPCs are one thing, but you were talking about arterial, arterial fibrillation, and you said that's the most common arrhythmia. Yeah. Why? Why is it the most common? We I don't think we actually know. Um, you know, people are, first of all, people are living longer, right? So, I mean, sometimes Western medicine gets a bad rap and, I, you know, as a practitioner of it, I certainly see its limitations. But the reality is, is, you know, uh, people are living a lot longer now than we did 50 years ago. Right. And the first person to live to 150 might already be born. Just think about that for a second, right? So um, there are things that we're making real progress in. And so what one of the consequences of that is we start seeing diseases pop up uh, because we're living longer and longer. And atrial fibrillation is an electrical disorder of the heart where the top chambers, the atria, are just chaos mm. rather than a nice organized rhythm that's being regulated by the sinus node. Atrial fibrillation is chaos in the atria. Mm. And it tends to be caused by a number of factors, obesity, alcohol, in some cases high blood pressure, but the most important factor is age. So mm. if you're 80 years old, about so twenty percent of people over the age of eighty have atrial fibrillation. That's which a huge is number. which is kind of makes sense though. I mean, things are kind of age cells are not. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Right. So they get tired. You but know? there's a lot more younger people today though having it. They are, and that's a product of a lot of things that we just talked about. You know, the fact that we don't probably eat as well as we should. Or sleep. Right? Or sleep totally. Yeah. Sleep apnea is a really uh, yes. important um, contributor to atrial fibrillation. So. More, you know, one thing we've realized, although I like to do ablations and they can be really helpful for people with AFib, with atrial fibrillation, it's the, 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 in many ways, the perfect disease to illustrate that you cannot solve it with a pill or with a procedure. You have to take a holistic approach to it. 
you know, even things like meditation and yoga, there's actually data to show that yoga um, can impact atrial fibrillation. Vagal system. Yeah, I totally agree, right? Yeah. And so, like, one of my dreams is to start, like, an AFib yoga class. But Ah, that would um, be great. Yeah, so it's it's been on the back burner, but hopefully soon. Because, we, we you know, I think we, we have to look at all different options in order to to address uh, diseases like this. Well, here's something that I've been studying and, and something that I believe has helped me quite a bit is I've been listening to, not to name names, but there are a lot of people out there that talk about meditation and stuff. So Joe Dispenza talks about, um, you know, doing a meditation where you try to deal with, I don't want to say chakra because it has a religious sound to it, but it's not that. It's There are certain energy factors in our system. So when you're able to squeeze out from the base of your, your core and you're able to push it up all the way up to your head and to ex exhale it out and you're doing this breathing, by the way, breathing is important to be alive, right? So when you're breathing deep in and you're holding it for a period of time, because CO2 is also very important in the body, and then you're expelling it out with intention. By the way, it's so important to have intention with everything you do because when you're clear with what you want, it's much more specific to your body. Because the thing is, I keep telling people, is your brain does not know when you're physically working out or if you're mentally working out, it sees it as the same thing. So when you're mentally having the intention of slowing down your heart rate, and by the way, this is how I've done this. Every time I've had an arrhythmia, I would do my breathing exercises with the intention of slowing down the arrhythmia. And every time I've done that, my arrhythmia had, had stopped. And this is, this is my own trial and error. This is my own experiment. So I'm not putting it out there as a general knowledge. This worked for me. And why did it work for me? Because you were saying oxygenated blood, oxygenated um, heart, uh, getting everything back to where, where it should be balanced. It usually helps to keep your body uh, at a homeostasis uh, place. So I believe that yoga practices um, have a lot to do with breathing. Absolutely. And that's where I think you have something there because that's why every time I talk to a, a yogi or a person who loves to do yoga or any type of breathing meditative type exercises, they've always somehow found a balance in their health. They may not got rid of it, but they've found yeah. a balance. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's funny that you, you know, you've come back to the Vegas a few times. You know, for certain arrhythmias that we treat, fast heart rhythms, we teach our patients to do what we call vagal maneuvers to nice. activate the vagus node, and uh, I'm sorry, vagus vagus nerve, and that will break the rhythm. So what you kind of just found that out on your own, right. you kind of just discovered it. But we actually you, we actually teach that to patients yeah. in order to help them control their, their rhythm. Most people don't know what they don't know. I mean, the whole point of the show is and the reason why I created the show is because as as someone who's you know what I always have to have somebody who's got a broken system, so to speak, to teach others because you've gone through the trial and error. And it's also on a selfish reason is because I get to get doctors like you in here and, and I actually get your hour of your time um, and pick your brain. And, and that's fun for me because I'm learning. But at the same time, I realize that most of my clients out there, because I'm a personal trainer by trade, they don't know what they don't know and they don't know what to ask. And when they come in front of you, they have no, they don't know what questions to ask you. Yeah. And you guys can't figure me out in 15 minutes. Yeah. You can't figure out my whole system in 15 minutes. I got to know me well enough to be able to say, this is what's happening. Right. This is what I need, I think. What do you think? I agree. We need at least 20. Yeah. <laughs> um, no. Yeah, no, but these are the realities of modern medicine. I, I hear this from patients all the time. Yeah. And actually, in, in, you know, for, 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 for new patients, I really try to take more time because yeah. you need to understand a patient. Every patient is totally unique. You know, yeah. they, they can have the exact same disease. But their experience of that disease is totally different than another patient. I mean, just take PVCs, for example. You're very symptomatic with your PVCs. Yeah, I was very symptomatic. I have patients that have higher PVC burden than you do. They don't, they feel, don't feel a thing. How is that possible? Is it because, you know what a doctor told me in, in Santa Barbara when I was there, and this is when I got diagnosed? He said, oh, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is your heart is a, a heart of an athlete, but you, you, the bad news is you, you have irregular heartbeat. And he goes, but because you're in such great shape, you're going to feel it more than someone who is overweight or someone who's not in shape. Because yeah. there's, there's, um, and, I, and I thought about that. I'm like, that's a weird thing to say to someone. What, why would he say that to me? Because I, I still don't understand that. Yeah, I mean, neither do I uh, so much. I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there may be something to it. Sometimes, you know, I, but I mean, look, the reality is we don't know. Yeah, I know. We don't know. 
atrial fibrillation, exact same thing. I have patients when they're in a fib, they don't want to even get out of bed, right? And then I have patients who are in it all the time, and the only reason they know is because they went to get a colonoscopy and they were told, hey, you're in a fib. They had no idea. And they were in it for maybe years. So the, there's still a lot of mysteries that we're trying to unlock with respect to can, these disorders. Can someone with PVC also have arterial, arterial fibrillation? Yeah, and actually I believe that there are a subset of patients who have frequent PVCs who will develop atrial fibrillation as a result of that. I had that once because I was having a, a ovarian cyst rupture. That's not the funnest thing experience in the it world. It doesn't sound like it. It's not fun. I was, it was the most, it, let me just put, put it to you this way. It's like um, having kidney stones almost to that level yeah, of Yeah, I've heard it's incredibly um, painful. But when I went to the hospital, I wasn't feeling that though. I wasn't feeling I was having the atrial fibrillation, but he, the doctor was like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. He goes, why? Because you're having the fibrillation. I'm like going, really? That's cool. I thought I'm like, it's, I'm such a weirdo. I'm like, really? That's cool. How bad is it? Wow. And he's like, well, it's it's pretty bad enough for me to be worried about it. But then it went away after the incident. So God. I thought, why would I have that? So now you need two ablations. No, no I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. Joking. I'm not going to do it now. Yeah. Uh, well, sometimes under, uh, you know, uh, conditions of, uh, I, I can't go into too much detail, but let's just say I have a patient that I saw in the hospital today who's been doing really well, and you know I didn't even, and, and suddenly she had recurrence of her atrial fibrillation, hmm. and I didn't even though I do this every day, I didn't put two and two together because I know that she is going through an incredibly stressful, like beyond stressful time, uh, you know, in her life right now. And I was thinking, why is she back in AFib? And then I realized, oh my God, like she's dealing with this incredibly she stressful situation. She needs stress management then. Yeah, everybody does, right? Yeah, all and we so, all do, yeah. And I have patients that are uh, in terrible shape with respect to their heart rhythm, and then they retire, and their heart rhythms just get better. And the, you know, just the day-to-day -day stress of the work that they were doing yeah. was so profound that it was making their heart broken. It was breaking their heart. And then they right. take a step back, they're retired, they're doing, you know, whatever else they're doing. Or they're unemployed, like me, uh, right now, because of my company closed down. And I, have been, I haven't really been working that much, except for doing the radio and some of my clients. But um, Was that having, stressful or not stressful? It was stressful. Yeah. But I noticed that when my stress went up, I got, I had a lot of flare-ups. Yeah. I had a lot of flare-ups. And being at home now with my animals, um, I realized that even though I'm stressed out just a little bit, but I've learned to control it, um, Maybe that's why my PVCs have gotten better. I, I, I think it's probably true. And, and you know, and, and the reality is, is it's easier for many doctors to prescribe a medication than it is to tell them to meditate. And it's easier for a patient to take a medication than it is to be devoted to, let's say, yoga or meditation or whatever. Yeah. The reality is, is there's room for both and a need for both. You know, I, I mean, there's, a, there's definitely a role for the right uh, patient for things like ablation medications. But, you know, things like weight loss, you know, let's... Uh, looking at the data for weight loss and atrial fibrillation. If you lose just 10% of your body weight and you have AFib, that's as powerful as taking flecainide. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so, but how do you, you know, I mean, obesity is not a choice. People, no one chooses to be obese, right? Yeah. So it, then it gets back into like the kind of food that we're eating and yeah. the availability, you know, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a big, big problem. And um, it, it has far-reaching effects. You know, our health is... is um, it's not a simple matter. So I know that with arrhythmias, there is a side effect too that can also be a part of um, an unwanted side effect, which is enlarged heart. Yes. So how do how do you c combat that? Well, it depends on the cause. So if the rhythm, so let's take PVCs for example. In some patients who have a lot of PVCs, that will cause the heart to enlarge, right? And so and it can cause a decrease in the ejection fraction. So if the PVCs are the cause of the enlarged heart then I have to get rid of the PVCs. And if I get rid of them with either ablation or medication, most times the heart will shrink back down to its normal size. Oh, interesting. And the ejection fraction will get better. Is, is it like a bicep? It just goes back, it gets small when you don't use it as much? Because you're working harder when you have an arrhythmia, right? Your heart's working harder, so. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit similar. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to make this work. You're trying to help me out no, here. Actually, no, it's not. No, it's not, okay. <laughs> it's okay. This is a good try. I know. Listen, I'm trying. You're I, doing I, great. I know. I, 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 like I said, I, I try to, I, I've had this a long enough since 2007, this uh, PVC, that I've, I've become 
uh, uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable on a lot of things. Yeah. So, um, because I have to, because I can't really expect you guys to figure this out for me. I mean, you guys can, but you can't do it if you don't know the right information. I think that's so important. I think patients need to be um, educated, educated, and to take ownership of their health as well. Yeah. And I really see the doctor-physician relationship as, as a partnership. Yeah. You know, rather than a paternalistic relationship. You're not. You don't have an I ego the size of King do. Kong to be like a dictator to the client's health. You're trying to partner up with right. them at an equal level. Too. I do. I mean, I have a pretty big ego. Well, I don't know. About that. That's, <laughs> I'm just joking. I think I think you're pretty pretty down to earth considering how successful and smart you are. I think for me personally, it makes sense, and this is why I have this show again too to tell people like you're saying, empower yourself to learn what you need to learn. And what I've also done for a few doctors is I created a um, a history list of what's happened to me uh, in along my youth all the way to this point, so that. If I need to send that to the doctor ahead of time so they can do some bullet points of saying, oh, well, when you were, if I had a neurological disorder, if this could be something genetic. Oh, a 2000, oh, you had a, okay, arrhythmia. Okay, here, I can see this is happening. So now he's got a roadmap, and I can give this to all my doctors to say this correlates with me, this doesn't, whatever it may be. I think it's important for people to have a medical history written down somewhere and giving it to their doctors so that they don't waste the time during the personal visit. So it's more specific conversation versus a general, nice to meet you. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And again, it gets back to this idea that you know your body the best. So a lot of times, even though I have suspicions about what may be going wrong with someone's heart, I'll often ask the patient, so, you know, what do you think? What do you think is going wrong? Like, why do you think this is happening? And oftentimes they'll come up with something that I haven't thought about, or maybe just give me some extra little bit of information that I might not have gotten. So, yeah, it really is a partnership and a dialogue that we need to enter into with our patients. And it's a very sacred relationship. I had a teacher um, when I was at Georgetown. He said it was a covenant. He used religious language. Uh, Georgetown was a, was a Catholic school. But it, covenant being that there's something sacred about that relationship between a healer and someone that's coming to you to be healed. And... Whereas I think in traditional Western medicine, there was this sort of hierarchy. There's a space, yeah. Yeah, I, we, you know, I think, and, and, and maybe it's a generational thing, but I think, um, I think at least in my practice, I try to engage in, in more of a partnership. Well, you can't be a very good doctor if you can't connect to the people you're trying to, to teach or to understand what their issues are. I, I mean, the same thing was as a, as a trainer. I can't help people unless I get personal with them. That's why it's called personal training. You know, medical doctors mm -hmm. are the same. You guys are just, you guys are just doing it in a different way and in a different level. Um, but I feel like the same idea goes to this: people come to you and they're opening themselves up to you. They're exposing their most private, you know, thoughts and feelings, and they're trusting that you're going to help them. And you can't, uh, you know. And, and a lot of times I feel bad because and this is why, like I said, I have this show. I really want to help people understand their bodies, that this isn't just about taking medication. I agree. I mean, you can't. You can't fix everything with a medication. Um, but what you can do is eat better, sleep better, um, exercise enough, not overly exercising, but enough, um, so that you're stressing the heart to a certain level, but not to a point where it's, it's exhausted and it doesn't want to function anymore yeah no, that's right um and again i you know we're really good at the reductionist model you know someone's got this little circuit in their heart i can go in ablate them cure them they're done you know no, it doesn't, not a problem anymore but most diseases actually aren't like that because they're the the they're connected to a whole range of other things and unless you address all of that other stuff chances are you're not going to really impact the disease in any meaningful way so taking holistic approaches to uh, these kinds of problems is, is really essential in most cases. So you would recommend some kind of like stretching yoga-like type classes for those individuals who are highly stressed? Maybe, maybe you know what I would suggest? Just, you can suggest your thing. Is I've gone on YouTube a lot. And in YouTube, there's a lot of guided meditation type um, videos. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> What, technology is a double-edged sword, but one of the nice things about, you know, everybody having a smartphone in their pocket, you know, is that you have access to that kind of stuff. I mean, there are a bunch of meditation apps, uh, Headspace. Yeah. I 
um, Headspace, that's a good called, one. Uh, Waking Up with Sam Harris. Um, and you, you have access to, to this kind of stuff at, at your fingertip. Um, one of my dearest friends uh, from California has been living with me um, for the last uh, several months. And um, as we speak, she's been doing a meditation uh, course with a guru in India. Ooh. Right? So um, I don't know if Helen's listening right now because she's probably meditating. But every day, <laughs> um. <laughs> she yeah, she's like doing this meditation. And then, you know, there's, I, I don't know how many because I'm not in the course, maybe let's say 20, 30 people it's virtual. from all around the world nice. talking to this like guru in India and asking him questions about the meaning of life. So the technology uh, so amazing. is, you know, has immense power if we choose to use it in the right way. And I do believe that we are our own creators, and I do believe that we can make our own um, reality to a so certain degree with our thoughts. And people don't realize this. The power of thought is, is amazing. And like I said, your brain, you have the brain, and then you have the mind. And your mind is more like your soulful self, and the brain is the functional part of your your your, your structure of your of your brain skull. And I always tell people that if you're able to, because I do a lot of life coaching and health coaching stuff for people, it's like if you can just stop for one minute every single day, start with a minute, and just be mindful, and just be and breathe in, and start thinking about what it is that you want, not what you don't want, what it is that you want, and just breathe that for a minute and then start going into it for five minutes and 10 minutes so that when you have these stressful moments, which at some point when I go back into the workforce again and I ha end up having these, these stressful moments, you gotta start empowering yourself with the ability to deal with the stress. How are you gonna do that? It's by going back inward, understanding who you are, what you want and how, how you want things to turn out. And then sometimes you might find answers to things that are happening to you. Um, and the only reason why I'm talking and letting you talk is because this part of, of my existence, because I'm the patient, I've had to figure this out on my own to figure out how can I get stronger and healthier and better for my life. Because I want to live another 40, 50 years if I can. I'm 50 now. I'd like to be 100, maybe, but healthy 100, not broken 100, you know? Yes, absolutely. Any other advice that you can give us? I think... You know, it's hard for people to process information from doctors a lot, you know? And, and I know of myself when I go to a doctor, and I'm a doctor, I take probably to go to a doctor more often. But I get tongue Just look in the mirror. Yeah. Hi doctor, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, and so I think reinforcing that idea that you have raised so eloquently about really taking ownership of your own health, you know, and when you're in a doctor's office, you know, sometimes it can be hard because we're throwing information at you and it, we're speaking a different language. And even though we're right. trying to, 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 to channel that language in a way that patients can understand, sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard yeah. to, to understand and it's hard to know where your patient's head is at a lot of the time. And that's right. really the art of medicine. So the more you know as a patient about your own condition, um, really the better off you'll be. Now that does not mean you need to come into our office with 600 pages printed out from Google. No, no, that's not, no, you don't want that. Because I will cry. <laughs> Highlight it, footnote, <laughs> footnotes, yeah, footnotes work. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, um, it's, it, well, you know, it's at the most part, I think I, I appreciate your, your, your being so, um, humble with with what you do i think you are very good at, as a patient factor you're very good at explaining things um maybe i'm a little bit more informed than the average person but i do feel like um i think the basic knowledge would you, you would do well with i think most people would understand you um, but the problem is most people don't want to hear it either yeah, yeah that's true no, and they don't want to don't. hear the truth yeah. yeah some people don't and you know you do your best and, and thank you for that feedback i do feel very lucky to have, be in a field, in a job where I actually really love interacting with patients every day. Yeah. The meetings, not so much. <laughs> but you Who know, likes meetings? But, and, and, and also, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't also recognize that I work with incredible people. Yeah. And the idea of like the sort of doctor, that like the, the guy on house that just like yeah. the, the oh. lone doctor. I mean, but, it's cool. But we need more houses yeah. though, man. We need more creative minds like Dr. True. House. 
Actually, one of my stories from Beverly City ended up on an episode of that. Was really? Something. But anyway, maybe next show we can talk about it. But any, anyway, you know, but the idea that one doctor can, you know, just save everything is kind of like a relic of the past. Like for me to be able to do what I do well, I need a team, and like yeah. I'm really lucky to be working with amazing. No, people. you've got a great staff, definitely without a doubt. Um, so we're at the tail end of our show, and, I, and God, it went by quick, but I feel like we've got enough information out there initially i probably will call you back because it's like this there's stuff still that comes out there but we'll try to figure out your schedule too but um dr singh tell me how are you accepting new patients i am you know i'm um, usually um if you have a heart rhythm disorder um you want to ask your primary care doctor or your referral. cardiologist mm -hmm. for a referral and um, you know, I've also just hired two awesome new partners. Nice. That um, are electrophysiologists, and they're super great as well. So great. again, it's a team. So, you know, if you do have a heart rhythm disorder, and, and yeah, you know, talk to your primary care doctor, or you can look us up. I'm, I'm David Singh is spelled S I N G H. <laughs> yes. So it's um, so you're located in P O B three. Yes. Yes. So Queens Medical, and um, well, I you know I just. I'm lost for words because we've talked about so much. I'm, I'm still process. Believe it or not, I'm processing everything you just said, and I'm and I'm and I'm trying to be a good host and, and give you you know some time to, to speak. But if there's any last words that you'd like to say before we say goodbye to, to the audience, go ahead. No, oh, I just am really appreciative to have the opportunity to do this. You know, like you know, th th this is a platform that you've created where you know people that are tuning in can can learn a lot. Yeah. And so um, I'm just really honored to. Be <laughs> Well, on that note, if you guys missed a portion of this show and you want to listen to it again, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Be Fit for Health. I will have the video up of us on there so you'll get to see Dr. Singh's face instead of just listening to his voice, his beautiful face that he got his hair done for uh, the show. I did. I got he my did. hair done for your Fluffed radio it up for us. So... Uh, go to Be Fit for Health on the YouTube there, or you can go to my website, Be Fit for Health. There is the podcast version of it um, on there, so you can definitely listen to it there. Um, like I said, we were talking with Dr. David Singh. He is the cardiac uh, electrophysiologist, and he is the best on the island, if I should say so myself, because I only work with the best on the islands. Because um, I'm very picky, guys. I'm picky with my doctors, let me just tell you. But if you have any questions on some of the things that we're talking about, contact me on my website, uh, Be Fit for Health. There is an area where you can go ahead and, and send me a message, and I'll try to respond to you guys as soon as I can. Other than that, you know what? I appreciate your time. Again, it's a beautiful day. Go out there, enjoy the sunshine, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care of yourselves and each other. Aloha. Yay! <laughs>